Boom blast. Thank you, thank you, thank you. You're far too kind for tuning in once again to a little thing we like to call the On Blast Podcast. As always, my name is Sheldon Alexander, and I'm joined by my guy, Andrew Webster. Webby, what is good? Well, another uh, two Jordan episodes in the book. Uh, if you're a lame and couldn't find the leak on all the other episodes. <laughs> How about that? Well, here's the thing. Here's the thing, right? So the leaks are all over the place. The full thing is out there. And I was tweeting about this and had some good conversations with people in my mentions about how I had the full thing and I'm not tempted to watch it. And there's a lot of different reasons why. One is I really enjoy the experience of watching it live and like consuming it with Twitter. And like, I think we value, like we always like watching sporting events or watching whatever as a community with Twitter. But I feel like in this instance where for the most part, we're either by ourselves or with our immediate family, anything that kind of seems like communal is like put on a pedestal. You know what I mean? Like you, you feel that even more like a hundred thousand trillion times more now because you're not around anyone ever. Right. Does that make sense? A hundred percent. But I did dip my toes into the leak. Um, I guess uh, I've seen next week's episodes, but the documentary I think is still so compelling and the engagement online is so great that yeah. I still watch the, the I still watch the two episodes that I had seen on Sunday just to see everybody's reactions and what the Twitter yeah. jokes were and what the other stories were. Um, and you know but, what? You bring up you bring up a really good point about that too, because like I'm still gonna watch it again. So you bring up a really good point there. I, I like that. Yeah, exactly. But like missing out on that communal stuff, like that that would be like out of the question. It's so it's so awesome on Sunday when everybody is just going nuts. And let me say, as having seen the next two, they mm -hmm. are fantastic. Like uh, yeah, it, that's that's the rumblings. Those are the rumblings. Yeah, especially the second half. I mean, the first half, is, I don't want to spoil anything, but, like, you get to see some of what we've talked about on this podcast before of being, like, uh, some of the coolest viz that you've ever seen from something that you've only heard about or read about before. Okay, okay, that's that sounds about, dope. That's about as far as I'll go with what happens next week. Okay, so that's what happens next week. But this week, for the masses anyways, the lames like myself, who are watching it in real time <laughs> with the public, Suckers. Suckers. <laughs> it was the Rodman episode, and we got a little bit of Phil mixed in, yeah, you know, yeah. but basically this, this two, two hours centered around Dennis Rodman. And to start, I would like to read a snippet from an article in the LA Times today, and Carmen Electra gave a very... Uh, detailed account about her relationship with Dennis Rodman. And can and we, so before she says, we do this, can we not just praise be to the gods for Carmen Electra, who still is looking yo, great. Is looking great. I was thinking about this today, right? As a, you know, as kind of gathering my thoughts for the pod and all that. Carmen Electra is like the Kardashian of her day, 100%. right? And so for her to still look like she does now, and that's, Damn near what thirty years later? That's crazy. Listen, I, do you know how old Carmen Electra is? Carmen Electra is so old that when I was in high school, I had a poster of her on my wall. <laughs> and let's let's keep it a buck. Right now, she still looks as good as you could put a poster of her on your wall now. Hondo, I mean, Pete. barring Hondo the wife. <laughs> exactly, they might get a little awkward. <laughs> Fair enough. Maybe I'll hang one up for you instead. There you go. Don't worry, man. I appreciate Don't worry. it. I got you. I got Put it in the background, in the background there. <laughs> but so Carbon Lecture does this, this interview with the LA Times, and she's describing, I think it was her birthday, and Dennis said that he had a surprise for her. So he puts her in a blindfold, takes her somewhere, and this is directly from the LA Times article. He finally takes my blindfold off. We're standing at the Bulls practice facility center court. It was crazy, like two kids in a candy store. We were eating popsicles from the fridge and pretty much having sex all over the damn place. Oh, in God. the physical therapy room, in the weight room, obviously on the court. 
Close uh, quote. Obviously. <laughs> Again, we think that the Kardashians have nothing on Carmen Electra, right? And, and like, I mean, the thing is, is that like this is b- before reality TV and like the internet really going crazy mm-hmm. and TMZ and everything. You could get away with. You know, having sex all over the United Center if you want it. You could get away with a lot of shit. Apparently taking 48-hour vacations in the middle of the season. First of all. (laughs) What? Imagine if if James Harden did that. Well, I mean, I'm pretty sure he didn't. No, I'm joking. I'm joking. (laughs) No. We joke around about James Harden, like, going to the strip club the night before a game. Right. This is Dennis. Like, and that's a big story where James Harden is like, has like this whole like internet sort of following, sort of, you know, Twitter life, let's say. Yeah. Well, there's, there's definite like rumors and uh, shots of what's been going on with James Harden and the ladies. And like stories out there, you know, TMZ reporting stuff like how my guy has his jersey retired in strip clubs and shit because yeah. that's how much he's making it rain. But like those are the things we're hearing now. This is Dennis Rodman going to his coach and saying, I need a break. And so obviously if you're listening to this podcast, I'm guessing you've watched the doc so you understand the situation where Scotty's been out for a while. Now Scotty's coming back. But while Scotty was out, Mike really leaned on Dennis a lot to give him, you know, some extra oomph, some extra work. And Dennis was putting in that that work. But one of the things Dennis talked about was his mentals. You know what I mean? And sometimes he needed those little, he needed a break every once in a while to kind of recharge mentally. And he goes to Phil and asks if he could get a little vacation, to which Phil obviously goes to ask Mike and I just love how Krauss isn't involved in this Reinsdorf isn't involved in this Phil goes to Mike (laughs) and to me Webby the thing that I love the most was how Mike was Mike goes Phil told me that Dennis wanted to talk to me about something (laughs) (laughs) and he's like once I hear Dennis wants to talk to me about something I get worried (laughs) yeah (laughs) <laughs> I thought that was amazing. But can you imagine that? Like, what is, how could the reaction possibly be okay? Like, how is that allowed? How well, is that acceptable? Well, what's incredible is that the, is that the Bulls, you know, whether it's Jordan or Phil or whoever, Reinsdorf, whoever ended up making the final decision of, you know, like, yeah, it's okay that he can do this. Almost like great foresight but in, in their part, especially to the, kind of like day and times that we're in now where mental health is such a big deal in mm-hmm. sports and in, in life. And there's that story where in the documentary where they're talking about uh, Rodman when he was still with the Pistons and mm-hmm. they couldn't find him and then they found him in his truck with a gun at the stadium in Detroit. And yeah. who knows, especially as Dennis became a little more eccentric, uh, as his spotlight became a little bit bigger – if the team had said, you know what, Dennis, that that's not professional. You have to stick it out. Like you talked about his mentals. Like, man, who knows what his breaking point could have been and how harmful it could have been for him or somebody else. Whereas, like, you know, Jordan and Phil and the organization saying, yes, you know what, take forty-eight hours, do what you got to do, recharge and come back. That now seems like really progressive thinking by. Uh, on the part of this uh, on the part of this basketball organization yeah it, it's super interesting and I, and I like that you brought up that point too because there is a duality to this story right there is like the fun aspect of oh my god this guy needs to go to Vegas but then there's the other side that I think they really did a great job of explaining about you know Rodman he's like working out and he gives a quote where he says I'll play the games for free you're getting paid for all the bullshit after you leave the floor And I thought that kind of really summed up. And I know some people think of it as like, oh, these guys are whining and you make millions of dollars and this, that, and the third. But even then, it's kind of a glimpse into the fact that it's not easy to deal with a lot of these things, right? And like, yes, you're getting paid millions and millions of dollars for sure. Totally get it. Totally understand it. A lot of people would trade places with them in a second. But it's just giving you kind of an insight and 
this is obviously an extreme case where my guy goes to Phil and asks it to be able to, to take a trip for, for 48 hours, but it did kind of explain the other side to it and kind of show you that it's not just about, you know, was it the Chappelle bit where he's talking about, you know, got to stop calling people crazy because it's, yeah. like, it's dismissive. Right, exactly. Right, exactly. instead of like just listening to what what my guy's saying, and he really just needed to recharge. And it so makes more sense now, seeing it in this context, correct me if I'm wrong here, why him and Phil got along, or why Phil was the one who was able to reach Dennis. Because they give you the little bit of a backstory on Phil, yeah. and you realize Phil kind of related to Dennis, not only in their style of play on the court, but they're very eccentric off the court as well, No. No, 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 you're absolutely right, and it's funny how they kind of pair these episodes together and releasing two at the same time, and having that, um, the juxtaposition of Rodman first, and then Phil's story afterwards, I mean, like, Rodman makes that great analogy, I think you hit on it, like, listen, in this 100 feet where we're playing basketball, I can control it, I'm in control, but then once you get outside of that, it gets a little hairy, and you could see the same thing with Phil's story, too, like, if everything's equal, you're playing with two nets and two rims, you know, he's a really great basketball player, but in the time that he was coming up in the NBA and in coaching, I'm sure he was looked upon by the media and his peers and even some fans as like, who is this long haired hippie guy who's tripped out on acid, right? Like <laughs> thinking that he's a lion. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, exactly. Uh, like I'm, uh, and then the other great thing was that little, like, you know, Phil being really interested in like native American, uh, history and everything. He had that name, for what Robin was like the person who ro- walks backwards. Yes. And that really clicked with Rodman too. He's like, Hey, you know, he's a good guy, but he just sees things and does things a little differently. It, it, we shouldn't be, you know, judging him or, or making him feel bad just because that's the way he is. I thought that was really interesting too. Totally. And there's kind of like a, a, a life lesson here. Right. Because I think like in terms of management and leaders, we all have bosses. We all might be bosses at some point. But to me, the the lesson here was having the understanding of the different personalities, because so much of your job is managing personalities. So having the understanding that, hey, I could try to fight Dennis on this, but he really needs to just recharge for a bit and we need him for the long run. So me fighting over him missing a couple regular season games or missing practices for a week doesn't really help us in the long run. So having that understanding to let him go, but then at the same time understanding, yo, Mike, you got to go get Dennis. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, <laughs> that is incredible. No, the other one, too, is when they bring him back and he's like... No, 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 but hold on, hold on. Before we get to that, though, because okay. when Mike goes to get Dennis and just hearing the story of... Mike telling it, and then hearing the story from Carmen, Carmen Electra's <laughs> viewpoint. She's like, I had to hop behind like, the couch. She's like, I hear the banging on the door, and she's like, I hid, and like, I hid under the covers. Like, that is just absolutely incredible. These are the stories that I was looking for in this doc. Do you know what I'm saying? Absolutely. These stories that we've never heard before that are just absolutely amazing. Because just imagine Michael Jordan, the greatest athlete probably ever arguably right having to go knock on dennis rodman's door and and mike's like i'm not even gonna talk about what was in the room or what was in his bed <laughs> oh, <God. laughs> it's so good and and mike knew the whole time right he tried to tell phil wait a second we let him go for 48 hours he's not coming back in 48 <laughs> yeah hours. that's the best he's like so what happened did he come back hell no he didn't come back <laughs> for 48 hours so good but no you were about to talk about when he came back when dennis came back right that was that was great too because it shows that you know it shows that that rest that he got you know the recharge that robin got was exactly what he needed because he comes back Mm -hmm. and they're gonna run him you know they're gonna do that thing where you you know the drill where you gotta run around and robin just had all the energy in the world and basically ran the rest of his teammates Yeah, we used to do that in high school for football. Oh, yeah. So we'd be doing that around the football field. And let me tell you, that (laughs) that drill will get you. And I love that Mike had the cheat of, listen, guys, we're all going to go slow. (laughs) (laughs) 
I like that. Mike's cheesed. He's like, I, why do I have to run because Dennis decided to go to Vegas? <laughs> like, these are the human moments that I was looking for, which I didn't really know that we were going to get. And if you remember back, I know we talked about when they announced this doc, and I was kind of worried. I was like, uh, I don't know. I feel like I know everything about Mike. What am I going to learn? What is he going to say? And people are saying the first four are like the weakest episodes. And yeah. yet I'm so entertained. I'm so in on all this. Mike's just been amazing, right? He gives zero fucks still to this day. It's, it's incredible, right? And him talking about Dennis just whooping everyone's ass in that running drill is, it's just such a good story, but gives you an insight into kind of the beast that Dennis Rodman was. Because how many dudes do you see? Like, there's a full-on montage, Webby, and we've, we've worked in sports for a long-ass time, right? How many montages have you ever seen of a dude just getting rebounds? Of rebounds, I know. <laughs> right? That's it, man. Unless it's and it, coming down on the broadcast, you're not getting it. And it was, like, entertaining with, like, cut to music. It was cut, like, you know, like a dude throwing down dunks, but Dennis is getting rebounds. Uh, what did you make of Dennis explaining the art, let's say, of rebounding? I was just going to bring that up. Like, <laughs> just, I mean, it was almost unintelligible, but, like, you could tell that he really puts in the thought and the mm -hmm. film study to see... Like, the other one is like, oh, Larry shoots, it's going to have a lot of spin. Magic shoots, mm, probably won't have that much spin on it. So you could kind of, but I thought that was so interesting. Like, I could listen to him talk about how he prepares for these rebounds for another 20 minutes. I mean, it was so interesting that, you know, if a guy shoots from the left block, you know, that it's not going to kick out quite as far as if it's a three-pointer. Like, that was awesome. Well, you know, just hearing other people talk about them, I think was really cool because it's one thing, you know, to hear someone talk about themselves and obviously we're gaining insight hearing him give that spiel. But to hear guys like, you know, whether it was Brendan Malone, shout out to the original Raptors coach, by the yeah. way. Right. But like hearing Mike say Dennis is one of the smartest guys I've ever played with, you know. That was so interesting to hear someone say because he's never really thought of in that sense. And then they're showing the clips of them on the bench talking defensive schemes and shit. Like it was just really interesting because I thought it was a, a different insight to Rodman than, you know, I'll be honest. I've always thought that rebounding was effort, right? And all effort, right? And I, and not that it isn't, but there's so much more to it, or Rodman's telling you there's so much more to it, and that's how you get someone averaging damn near 20 rebounds a game in a season, right? But also just having the smarts, Rebby, to say, I'm going to accept this role of being a defensive guy and a rebounder, and that's going to be my role, and that's going to get me this career, a, a Hall of Fame career at that. What did you think about him just, you know, even in the early days, because he put in work in college, but then deciding once he got to the league, this is the role that I'm going to play. This is how I'm going to succeed. Well, and I think that he was very, like, thinking forward throughout his entire career because I think that he was probably even a better player with the Pistons, a more complete player with the Pistons, a better mm -hmm. defender. And then by the time he got to the Bulls, it was just like, oh, here's the one skill I can do better than anybody else, which is rebound. So. Yeah. I think that having that like understanding of your own career shows the intelligence that Rodman had more so than we give him a lot of credit for. Yeah, I totally agree, man. And and the thing that was cool too, again, they went through the the full episodes like they've done. I'm guessing they're going to do all way, all the way through where they weave back and forth from time just to kind of you know have all these stories intersect. Right. And so we get back to the Bad Boy Pistons. And oh, yeah. for me watching all those highlights, I all I could think about was, man, I kind of miss some of that. Like, there got to be somewhere in between that montage of the bad boy Pistons just fouling everybody <laughs> yeah. and what we have today where there's like a touch foul and they got to review it for three hours to see if it's a flagrant two or not. No, you're absolutely right. There's got to be some kind of uh, in between that we can reach because... Uh, because especially now, I mean, the replay thing is nuts. It just takes too long. <laughs> yeah. But, but I thought that was the best part of the documentary was the oh. was the bad boy Pistons thing because 
that great 30 for 30 documentary about the bad boys was awesome but the yes, one thing it, was. It, it was really good the one thing it didn't have was jordan's real reaction to what isaiah said about walking off the court when the mm-hmm. bulls had finally beat them and i thought that was the best part of about last night's two episodes was them giving mj the ipad of <laughs> and he goes all right jordan this is what Isaiah said, and he's like, doesn't matter what he says. He could say anything in this clip. He doesn't mean it. I was like, man. And then, bro, in the next episode, it'll get into a little bit more of that. It's like just that Jordan Isaiah thing, man. Like, yeah. it's crazy. I mean, he really, really, uh, he's pretty, like, the funny thing about Jordan is that he's pretty, like, respectful about, like, his other peers and the other people mm-hmm. that he was playing with. Whether it's Barkley, Magic, Bird, Sean Kemp, he, he oh, there's another. I I gotta remember. I can't spoil it. But some <laughs> other some other people that you'll see that he's like talking with, yeah. like really respectfully and jokingly. But just that Isaiah thing, man. He did that against the Bulls, and that was it. And it was like Jordan never gave him a real other chance after that. Like you, you. I love the fact that all these years later. MJ still doesn't like the Pistons. Like, that to me is amazing. But right? Like, that's why, you know, because we get so caught up in sports, right? And we we have moments where we, we feel like we're living and dying through sports. And we're sitting on our couches watching. Or maybe going to the games and watching. But either way, we're not in it. And then sometimes you get kind of let down if you feel, wait. Why does it seem that I might care a little more than this guy who's playing, right? You know what I mean? And Mike is a complete opposite of that because that is, forget about how good he is, but the mentality of wanting to win all the time, that's who you'd want to cheer for. That's, those are the guys that you'd want, you know, your home team to be. And so to have all these years pass and he's still so salty and As you said, once they gave him the iPad, he wasn't hearing it. He's like, whatever he says is not going to be able to prove that he's not an asshole. I thought that was so, so interesting. But there's a bunch of stuff here. Let's talk about this right now. The the Pistons walking off the floor. There's a lot of different things that have that's been said. And of course, Isaiah tried to like kind of backtrack and apologize. But I know what I think and I don't want to sway you in either way. You know, let me let me hear. What what did you take? What did you take of just what we saw last night and what Isaiah said as his excuse for why they walked off? Which was he said, Lame Beer told him, came up with the plan, and they were just going to walk off. And his his other reasoning was what? Uh, Bird walked off on them. Yeah, yeah, it was the year before. I, I think that uh, in in this moment, I'm going to agree with Jordan. And again, like he doesn't suffer for any BS. And I thought that. What Isaiah was saying last night was a whole bunch of revisionist history. No, yeah. of course they were upset. They got swept. They were <laughs> always they were always playing us against the world with these bad boys Pistons teams. It was always how they've been wronged, how they were the victims, and so of course they walked off the thing. And it doesn't surprise me that Lambeer was the one that organized it, but <laughs> if, if you're Isaiah Thomas, you're obviously the leader of that team, and if you yeah. didn't want to do it, you could say, no, let's show them some respect, and they didn't. So, no, I, I like... Hundred percent, they meant to do what they did. Yeah, they're they're grown men. Like I don't give them any sort of uh, any sort of respect for for what they did or any kind of excuse. So there's a lot of things, obviously, that'll trickle out after these episodes air because there's so many different people doing interviews and John Sally's kind of doing the rounds, and he right. said that um, in the moment. He was like, nah, I don't really want to do this. Like, he wanted to ask Chuck Daly to put him back into the game because he didn't want to walk off the court because he thought that was disrespectful. And he already had a bit of a relationship with Mike and those guys anyways. Not like, you know, there's still the rivalry, but he was saying he didn't think of it was cool in the moment. But sticking with Isaiah here, okay? The reason to me why I thought Isaiah was kind of fishy was because my guy didn't say, like, I made a mistake or I should have done whatever. He blamed Bill Lane Beer, and then he blamed Larry Bird. There was no, like, actual accountability by Isaiah Thomas at all, right? It was just, well, you know, 
uh, Bill Lambeer came up with the idea, and I was like, yeah, I followed him. And then Larry Bird did it to us, and that was kind of how they passed the torch to us. And so we decided that's how we're going to pass the torch to them. And it's like, come on, bro. Yeah. Like, at least own up to it, stand behind it. You know what I mean? Then at least I'd be like, okay, cool. Like, I, I rep it. You know, I, I can rep that. I might disagree, but at least you're standing behind what, you, what you're saying. No? No, no, no. You're... A hundred percent correct, and that's kind of been uh, like uh, cornerstone of Isaiah's career after basketball. It's never his fault. The <laughs> a the way that shysty. yo the way that he ran the Raptors wasn't his fault. The way mm-hmm. that he basically buried the Knicks for however many years he was there wasn't his fault. Like yeah. that, at some point, you have to take responsibility for what you're doing. And Simmons brought up a point. He was talking about the whole angle that, oh, well, the Celtics ran off. And I don't know if this is I true. I heard this, too. I heard this, too, about the letting people on the court. So, yeah, which, like, obviously there's a ton of video. Like, we've seen a bunch of video where you'll see after in those days in the 80s when teams, even in the NBA, would have big wins, the home fans would rush the floor. So what Simmons was saying was that, you know, they were leaving the floor early because the road team would leave the floor to avoid being trampled by the home fans. That was just a thing that would happen. And so that doesn't really hold water for Isaiah because against the Bulls, they they were the home team. They were at home, yeah. So it's an interesting twist, but I don't really think many people are buying what Isaiah is selling anyways, right? Like, I mean, I wasn't. I don't think you were either, right? No. No. And definitely, uh, your man's Horace Grant wasn't, who called them straight up bitches. Yeah, that was pretty which, sweet. Yo, Horace Grant looks like he could still play now. He's swole. Man, he's <laughs> huge. <laughs> oh, man. That was awesome. That was, It was awesome, too, how they, again, weave back and forth. You got a bit of the Rodman story. Yeah. And, you know, we talked earlier, we mentioned Brendan Malone, who had a description of Rodman. Like, they were trying to figure out, I guess he was, like, either slacking off in practice or something, and one of the assistant coaches were getting mad, and he said, listen, Dennis, he goes, just leave him alone. You don't put a saddle on a Mustang, (laughs) which I thought was just a great quote. (laughs) Well, yeah, and just the fact that, you know, it, it again speaks to Rodman's talent and intelligence that Mm -hmm. the coaches that he had like Daly was a big proponent of Rodman, you know, yeah. knew how talented he was, knew that he needed a hand to un- unleash that talent, just like Phil did. Yeah, totally, totally. Um, and so I, one of the things I did love, I want to mention before we move on, is Rodman, them describing the, the bad boy Pistons and the Jordan rules. And like they try to make it seem so elaborate where there were things like if he goes left, do this. If he has the ball here, do that. Yeah. But essentially it was anytime he drives to the basket, put him on his ass. Hurt him, yeah. <laughs> right? So good. And where I've been describing how Rick Mahorn taught him how to play defense, or sorry, he told he how taught to him how to elbow someone. Yeah. yeah <laughs> if don't you're gonna give do away it, che- mean it. <laughs> yeah, don't give away cheap cheap fouls, really make him feel it. Yo, so good, so Rick Mo- good. Rick Mahorn was a badass. Oh yeah, like that's what I'm saying. There's something kind of gangster about the the bad boy Pistons, and it it makes you kind of laugh when you hear like Draymond now, right? Like those kind of tough guys now, like what we call tough guys in this modern NBA. Do you know what? I, I'm, like it's so odd. It seems so different now. Could count tough guys in the NBA on one hand. Well, you know, my favorite was still Zebo when he's talking shit to, to uh, was it Boogie Cousins? I think he's so, like, yeah. Because Boogie was talking shit to someone, and Zebo's like, listen, where I come from, bullies get bullied. <laughs> I was <laughs> like, yo, that is a gangster line on so many levels. Um, but Doug Collins. Listen, first of all, Doug Collins' okay. hair. Ooh, okay. Absol- absolutely fantastic. Yeah. Solid, solid mop on on a Doug Collins, old school Doug Collins. Uh, it was cool to see that because I didn't know much about the Doug Collins days. Obviously, I knew that when Mike came back with the Wizards, one of the, he wanted Doug Collins, so you knew that they obviously had a great relationship. Yeah. But to get the full breakdown in terms of you know Doug Collins just kind of let Mike cook, and he is kind of like a he was definitely a player's coach for sure, right? But 
hearing the little stories, the little tidbits. Again, this is why I'm here. Doug Collins talking about how nervous he was for his first game, and he's sweating buckets, and yeah, it's sweating. at MSG, and Mike just goes to him. He's like, don't worry, coach. I'm not going to let you lose your first game. And my guy <laughs> drops 50. <laughs> like, at the time, it was the most anybody had scored at MSG, I think. That shit is incredible. That's great. Right? Like, that is amazing. Those are the stories I'm here for. Now, but, I- I love the Doug Collins thing because the thing about Doug Collins going back from then to all the way from when he was coaching up until just a couple of years ago was that Doug Collins is the coach that you want for the first three years, first two years maybe with a young team. And Mm -hmm. then he hits his sell by date. Right. (laughs) And like, that's always been his MO. And the really interesting thing was when he was talking about Phil being was one of his assistants and he was like, mm, I could have, uh, you know, I could have told you that, that Phil was in line for the job. And the guy goes, oh, can you elaborate on that? And he's like, I, let's just say I could have told you that, that Phil, like, that's, I, yeah. I wanted more of that. Like, where I wanted was, more of that juice, for yeah, sure. Yeah, for sure, man. Um, yeah, because you could tell he had more to say, but he didn't really want to get into it. And it seems kind of fishy. Right, like it, it definitely seems like Phil was working behind the scenes or some stuff. Well, with after Tex that Winter came out and stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it, the explanation of the triangle offense and just in terms of how that got integrated and how Phil ended up getting the job, that storyline was was super cool as well. But sticking with the Doug Collins years before we get we we move on from that, the shot. Right, famously oh, the, known as the a shot over Elo. That was incredible to see. That was incredible to to get the context behind the iconic moment for sure. And to me, the the great storyline here is your man's Ron Harper. <laughs> yeah, he's like, right? yeah, whatever. So, it's some fucking bullshit. So, yeah, so Ron bad. Harper, first off, Jordan's like, and and this is why Jordan is the man because he's not holding back, and he's like, they had Craig Elo on me. Which was a mistake. <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> so good. And it cuts to Ron Harper. And I love that Ron Harper wanted the smoke. Ron Harper wanted to guard Jordan. And he was good he's in the it. huddle. He was saying yo, that he was having success guarding Jordan. Yo, notice how there's no mention of their coach, Lenny Wilkins. I wonder if they took yeah, that out. That, right? Yeah. Because they kept showing shots of Lenny Wilkins, but they didn't actually mention the coach they were just like yeah i told coach i wanted to guard mike and he said no and ron harper heard the quote he's just like yeah okay fuck this bullshit <laughs> and i was like my guy is still salty I even know. after how everything else turned out <laughs> he's still salty that craig elo got cooked by mike on that final play the other That's one that awesome the other one that I liked was that we found out what Jordan is saying after he hits the mm. shot and turns around because the all the reporters in Chicago thought that, you know, they were going to get cooked by the Cavs. Yeah. And yeah. then they, he, what was it like? Go the fuck home. Go the go fuck, the fuck home. home. He's telling everybody, <laughs> the reporters, <laughs> the Cavs fans, everybody, go awesome. home. <laughs> it was awesome. So good. And uh, Doug Collins, a post-game interview. Oh, it's they all asked Doug Collins. So, what was the play? <laughs> well, give the ball to Mike. Everyone else, get the fuck out of the way. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, so it's pre- it's pretty simple. Being a coach of Michael Jordan, like that's the thing. Like the triangle offense was, you know, maybe necessary in the later latter part of his career and part to getting the teammates involved. But eh, listen, you could pay me five million dollars a year just to just to say get the ball to Michael Jordan, and let him cook. Yeah. Yeah, I think, oh yeah, I think that actual post game was, might have been after one of the games in the Pistons series, actually. I might have had that wrong. I think it was after the, it was in the Pistons series, that clip from Doug Collins, get out of the way. But either way, I'm sure it's not the first time, (laughs) first of many (laughs) times he probably had that quote, right? Exactly. Um, But we talked about the Jordan rules already and them beating up Mike all the time. Uh, the Dennis factor and how Dennis fit into that. And we got a cool story or kind of the cool story because it doesn't really get too in depth about how Dennis left the Pistons, got to the Spurs. They kind of skipped over a lot of the drama Dennis had with the Spurs. But I guess the interesting part was this was when he met Madonna. 
And, right? Yeah, and Madonna was the real catalyst for how we remember Dennis Rodman. Yes. And I thought that was pretty cool. And we kind of knew that, but to have it more to have it more explained was kind of cool, right? And and even just like the fact that Dennis changed his hair because of Demolition Man. Shout yeah. out to Demolition Man, by the Yo, way. Wesley right? Snipes. Let's go. Yo, that's an underrated action movie. Doesn't get enough love, Demolition Man. But that's a dope movie. I don't care what anybody says. But yes, Dennis changing his, his hair because of Wesley Snipes and Demolition Man is kind of hilarious. But well, just that Wesley Snipes, like, like I mean, Rodman's hair was the biggest deal growing up. Mm-hmm. And just that it all started from Wesley Snipes. Remember how cool it was in, like, NBA Live, like, 95 or whatever it was, that Dennis had colored hair? <laughs> yes, yeah. Right? Exactly. Like, we were so hyped because of that. Like, oh. Remember, it was like they had Pippin, they had Rodman, and then they had number 23. <laughs> yes. They couldn't pay those bucks to get MJ <laughs> in the game. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> so good. So good. Um, but, yeah. Then it obviously intertwines how they end up getting Dennis. Phil talking about his first meeting with Dennis not being that good, which I thought was hilarious. Um, I want to give a shout out to the the Craig Sager. Just quick walk yeah, past. That was amazing. And I'll be yo man. I'll be honest. The quick clips of Sager, even when David Stern popped up earlier, like those kind of like paused me for a second, right? Like I kind of perked up when both those things happened. I was like, oh yeah. Oh, man, that's, that sucks. You know what I mean? It was good to see Sager, though, being Sager and giving Rodman 20 bucks to pay his fine. And I thought that was really cool. So young. He looks so young. Oh, yeah. Sager is so good. Um, we keep talking about Scotty because I think Scotty is an interesting figure, and he will be, obviously, throughout this whole thing. But if last episode was boosting up Scotty, you know, trying to, you know, oh, at one point, was he the second best player in the league? And when mm-hmm. Mike left, was he the best player in the league? And there's kind of like a lot of hyping up with Scotty. And I remember, I want to, I want to think I remember a lot from those times, Webby. But obviously, I don't remember everything. But one of the things I do kind of remember is Scotty being a bitch at certain points, right? <laughs> one of them was obviously the Ku coach moment, right? Right. When he's mad that Phil drew up the play for Ku coach, that's obviously a huge bitch move but i want to get your take on the migraine game seven because I mean, you could tell you could yeah. tell mike you could tell mike was saying all the right things but it didn't really sound like mike was fully on board with the fact that scotty had a migraine in game seven did it well you're absolutely right and i mean that migraine game is pretty infamous with how bad he was in the game seven but what i didn't realize until i was listening to simmons and Rosillo today was that that game was only like two or three days after scotty's dad died oh and i didn't know that like oh i didn't know that either now i not know that again i haven't fact checked that i'm just going off of another (laughs) podcast that i listen to but if if that's true it's like that's a little it makes a little more sense but you know what the migraine game really reminded me of was the was it game seven lebron with uh the game seven lebron losing yeah to boston okay yeah at home I think it was game six. Like the infamous one, like his last game where he's walking and takes off the jersey, like that one? Exactly. And he was just absolute – he was terrible. Yeah. Like he just didn't have it. And it was like, what – like what's going on here? Like I thought this guy – now it's obviously a little different with Scotty in the kind of situation he was in with Jordan and and things like that. But it it just kind of – Hit me the same way. It's like, oh, like this is such an important game, and yet yeah, brought this built-in excuse. Now, of course, LeBron didn't have an excuse. It was just we were all kind of waiting for the excuse when that happened. You know, yeah, like, we're how could well, he? Be, like how the could excuse he, we kind of thought was LeBron's on his way out. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and he knows it exactly. But <laughs> that, 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 those two performances kind of like when I saw that Scotty migraine game again, I was like, oh, it's kind of like LeBron. But um, you know but, what? It, Oh, yeah, go ahead. No, no, no. I was going to say, I was thinking right away, and I wrote this down. I'm like, I don't know if Scotty wanted the smoke. 
that's what I, I don't know why, but Ooh. that was a feeling I was getting. And then when Mike started talking, I was like, yo, I don't think Mike thought Scotty wanted the smoke no. either. And the way that they kind of t- end up telling the story of, okay, so they lose that game seven. And I think it's BJ Armstrong. That's like, we didn't go on vacation after we went to the gym yeah. and we all stayed around and worked out. I was kind of like, oh yeah, I don't think Scotty wanted the smoke in that game seven. Cause we, t- Hey, we talk all the time, Webby, about the raps and about, you know, superstars and there's levels and, you know, that game seven at that moment, like Scotty was a nice player, but to get over that hump and then into the championship, right? Like that's a different level. That's another gear. And that's kind of what it is about elevating to superstar levels. And I don't know if he was there yet. And I, and I keep pointing to this, but I really don't think Mike was buying that either. <laughs> So, question for you then that I have is, say Scotty had gotten traded, whether it was to the Celtics or to the Raptors or wherever he was going to go, had he gotten traded when he did, would Scotty be the man? No, I don't think so. Would we remember him with the reverence that we remember him today had he gone to a different team? I don't think so because... Oh, you mean like when he got if he got traded in like ninety seven or whatever it was, he, or you think about it even earlier or whatever, or like early were, on. Yeah, uh, no, because I think that what we got after that game seven in terms of them all going into the lab and realizing like we got to take this next step, we got to take this next level, and all of them talking about how Mike came in just super focused at next, right? Like them talking about seeing Mike cry after losing that game seven. And mm-hmm. him describing crying with his dad, right, after losing that game seven to the Pistons. Yeah. And then just seeing the work that my guy was putting in in the weight room and then had all of them putting in the same amount of work. And they said that's when he really started turning into, you know, Mike being a real asshole in practice and calling guys out all the time when they were messing up. And he became really hard on Scotty and you know, described how that kind of changed their whole mentality going into the next season. I don't know if, if, if that stuff doesn't happen, like, you know, like the Mike asshole, someone in the, in the doc, I can't remember if it was BJ Armstrong or Horace, but they're talking about how Scotty always had the talent, but he just didn't have the Mike mentality. Right. And then Mike's mentality started to rub off on him. And that's what you saw in the 91 playoffs where, you know, they're getting roughed up by the Pistons, but they're not reacting anymore to it. But it was right? almost And even like, Mike was like, okay, that's when I knew we were good. That's when I knew we were going to win. The fact that they could just throw Scotty on on Magic, right? <laughs> right? Yo, and have him put was, the clamps on Magic, that's crazy. Was that right? last but, night's episode two? Yeah, that was last night's episode, okay. yeah. Yeah, yeah, that was Because Jordan was awesome. got cooked, but... I can't say Jordan got cooked, but Magic had a good game against Mike in game one. Magic. And in game two, they threw Scotty at him. And Scotty was just guarding him full court. Yo, Magic and that's is, just incredible. The, the kids today just don't realize how nice these guys were. Like, well, hold on, Magic, hold on. Magic I'm sticking Johnson, to that point. Sticking Magic to that Johnson point, though, Larry Webby. Bird were two of the best of all time. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, sticking to that point, how many times have we heard over the past two years? Oh, look at Nick Nurse throwing out the trap. Nobody, nobody presses. Nobody does this. Nobody does that. And it's like, well, actually. <laughs> Here's some video of magic or of magic of Mike and Scotty putting on a full court press here. Yeah. In like 91. <laughs> okay. So if Mike can do it, I'm sure anyone else can. It's can you get can the coach actually get the team to buy in and do it? Exactly. But, now the the other thing that I wanted to say was like uh, about that Scotty taking on Mike's mentality mm-hmm. was that Scotty never could really totally focus and harness that Mike mentality like Jordan could, obviously, right? But it seemed yeah. like he put a lot of that same kind of thought process and then turned it against the organization, the coaches, or not the coach, but the front office. Like, Scotty was definitely the one who was way more filled with vitriol against Jerry Krause and against Reinsdorf, whereas Mike took that energy, took that negative energy, and kind of focuses on a more positive thing on the court, right? That's what it kind of felt like to me. 
No, I like that. I like that. The good lessons in there, right? Where you're focusing all your energy, how you're turning negative energy into positive energy. You're totally right about that. And even just a lesson of, you know, them getting beaten down and losing and then coming back stronger Yeah. the next year, right? Learning it's like, from those mistakes and stuff like that. Sure. Yeah. And they came back and just whooped ass that next year. If you think about it, you win the finals in five. They swept the Pistons in the conference finals. Yeah. Like, it was just a team that was ready. And obviously, you know, the other part of this and the people who, the Jordan detractors will say, right? You see it in full evidence that Mike and Scotty, like, they're in peak powers at that point. But, like, the Pistons are on their way down. Magic's on their way down, right? Like, there's a lot of talk that it was even a, a feat for Magic to drag that Lakers team yeah. to the finals that year. Yeah. So, you know what I mean? It, it was interesting to see that kind of where people were at that point of their careers. And it's the same thing. when Like, that's just how it always goes, right? Like, LeBron was coming up as Kobe's on his way down. Or, you know, LeBron's on his way up into his championships as the Celtics are on their way down. Right. Right, like, and that's just kind of the circle of life, how it yeah, all goes, just, right? That's that's how sports is, right? Mm -hmm. That part was super interesting to see. I thought, I thought the whole part, you know, there's just so many great quotes throughout this whole thing in terms of we touched on it earlier, but um, explaining the whole when Mike finally relented and like the moment of, okay, well, you need the team to win. And Doug Collins had him scoring like 34 a night or whatever it was. But then Phil comes and it's like, okay, well, we're doing a triangle offense. And having MJ explain we're in the finals against the Lakers and Phil's getting on him and saying, Paxson is open. Yeah. Just pass him the ball. He's wide open every time. And then Paxson's just wetting shots. <laughs> but Mike buying in, I think it was J.J. Redick tweeted it earlier to, or last night after the game. He's just like, think about how, I'm paraphrasing, but he was saying Mike at that moment, okay? He's MVP of the league, MVP of the All-Star game, defensive player of the year. Um, slam dunk whatever, competition winner. Slam dunk contest winner, all that, all at the same time. And here's a guy that adjusts to say, okay, well, I need my other teammates or, you know, how do you adjust to what's what do we need to do to win, right? Instead of just having it be all on himself the whole time. Like I thought mm -hmm. that was just an, uh, a really cool admission to see from a guy who's in the league and obviously who has played with some of the best players who haven't been able to get over the hump, probably because they get in their own way. And I'm talking about I'm Joel not talking Embiid. about your Sixers. You're talking about no, no, no. Joel Embiid. I'm talking about the Clippers, right? Like oh, Blake Griffin and, Blake Griffin and, uh, and Chris, Paul. Chris Paul, right? Like I've heard JJ Redick tiptoe around the fact of, you know, what happened with that Clippers team and how they should have been a lot better. Yeah. Right. And so it was interesting to hear him and I'm going to find it cause I want to give him proper credit for, for what he said. Cause I thought it was really, really cool. Here it is. He said, my biggest takeaway from episodes three slash four circa 1990 MJ he was the greatest player in the world, MVP, All-Star Game MVP, scoring champ, Eastern Conference Finals appearance, etc., but was willing to adapt to a new system slash philosophy in order to achieve a higher level of success. Right? Like that, that to me <laughs> that, sums it up pretty well, right? That's veiled shots at, uh, at your boy Blake and... Uh... Hey, I wasn't, I wasn't saying Paul? all that. I wasn't saying all that. I, I just thought it was interesting insight from someone who's been through a few battles, let's say. Right? Sure. Whether it's with the Sixers, whether it's with the Clippers. But I've heard him talk about how that Clippers team, I think it was the first year, was like, that team should have won. Yes. One of their early years, he was like pretty adamant about how that team should have won. So I always like hearing what the actual players are saying and how that lines up to what we're seeing as just, you know, schlubs on our couch. On our couch is like, oh, MJ's the man. MJ's awesome. <laughs> right? But so, seriously, think about that. MJ's used to getting whatever he wants, and then all of a sudden feels like, yo, we're losing here. You got to pass the ball. Paxton's open. You're working way too hard. <laughs> right? So the other thing that I really liked was that uh, I think it was Phil, and he was talking about uh, how with this triangle offense, listen, Michael, you know, you've been having these great uh, statistical individual years, but with this new program, we're going to win, but you may not win scoring titles. And I just brought up 
Jordan's uh, reference page, and he won scoring titles in 91, 92, 93, 96, <laughs> 97, and 98. So, <laughs> so I think Phil was a little off with that one. <laughs> That's awesome. That is amazing. So good. Um, I know you wanted, we were kind of talking about this before we started recording, but your man Scott Burrell. Oh my God! <laughs> Listen, he, but the but the poor girl he was dating at that time, <laughs> right? MJ just like sewering my guy, right? And first off, MJ is way too happy for winning a hundred bucks on a Super Bowl bet. Yo, for someone but... who's making thirty six mil, my guy's a little too happy for winning a hundred bucks off someone. Uh, Who do you bet on? He bet on the Broncos. Right? <laughs> That's right. My guy's a little too happy for that, but um, just wait until the next. There's there's a I was awesome just gonna story ask. in the next episode about this. I was just gonna ask, and you could just answer with a yes or no. But I was just gonna ask. I've heard that as the series goes along, it's more of that kind of footage, the behind the scenes, you know, card MJ. playing. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I just thought that was amazing. And Scott Burrell's like, yo, man, my parents are watching. <laughs> He's like, hey, hey, Scott Burrell's parents, he's an alcoholic. <laughs> he's like, you're coming in playing all hungover. You haven't slept. You call you Rodman <laughs> Jr. Um, I I can't not mention this on this podcast, but uh, Jerry Krause's dance moves after they win the championship. <laughs> yo. <laughs> yo. Yo. MJ winning. Hold on. Hold on. MJ winning his first championship <laughs> in L.A. Like, imagine that party. Oh, my God. That night. Woo. Oh, my God. Woo. Like, well, I mean, but that's the thing. It didn't. Do you think that MJ really partied it up? Like, I'm sure, like, he had a couple of cigars. Oh, the other one is, listen, the Rodman <laughs> drinking the Miller Lite before he gets on the motorcycle as well. I was, <laughs> I was blown away. I was blown away Yo. by that. Where did the hold on? Where did the footage come from of the the Rodman party montage? Where's that footage from? What like where they're drinking kamikazes? Where he's in the club and he's just like there's like all these just different women around him. Yo, I have no idea, man. That was incredible. The footage finding in this, like, you know, at some points while watching this, I get my like nerdy producer hat on, and I'm like, how did they get this? The Phil Jackson coaching in Mexico. Oh, Puerto footage, Rico. Right? Or Puerto Rico. So yeah, those bad. were some crazy stories, too, about the mayor of the town who <laughs> shot the ref. And they were like, mm, you can't come to any more home games for a year. Home games. Yo. Oh, this doc is so good. And and I, you listen to Simmons. I listen to Simmons. Them talking about how they didn't really like these episodes. I'm like, all right, cool. Maybe it's a now, it's an age gap because they knew more of that stuff. I don't know. But I, I love the storytelling. I love the random footage. I love the, how the they, one thing they, the one thing I will I will say about that is that first of all, there there sorry, two things. The first is is that it almost seems like this could be a way longer documentary because they're breezing okay. over some things. You mentioned For it, sure. they they breeze over this and that. Now, of course, to fit everything in this guy's career into a 10 episode documentary is completely incredible, but the fact of the matter is is that they got Jordan's sign off. So, I don't know how hard hitting it can be For and sure. how kind of um how controversial this documentary can be uh, just because, like I say, Mike's got to sign off on everything. And while he might come off like an asshole here or there, it's not like we're going to get any like really kind of revelatory things that are going to yeah. blow us away. Th those are my only two uh, kind of complaints on the documentary through the first four episodes. Okay. Okay. I will say I'm pleasantly surprised through the first four episodes. And, you know, if everyone keeps saying that it gets even better, I I can't wait. Like, I'm just even that more hype, that much more hype waiting for the other episodes. Because oh, the next two are, I can't even, like, I can't even explain. It. The next two are just so like, good. Like, there's just so many one-liners that we're even leaving out of this, right? But, like... How Carmen Electra says she called it an occupational hazard to be Dennis's girlfriend. Yeah. <laughs> like, <laughs> that was... it's just... So a couple questions I want to ask you, Webby, just to round out this podcast, okay? Yeah. 
couple questions. So, did Dennis Rodman invent load management? <laughs> what with the forty-eight hours? <laughs> I thought we did load management last week, wasn't there? Who was? Oh no, it was Jordan who invented load management when they he was coming back from the uh, bad foot, right? Oh, Scotty, you mean Scotty? Scotty, yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, okay, so who invented load management? Or let's say who did load management better, Dennis or Scotty? <laughs> oh, listen, well, Dennis, because the listen, forty-eight hours in Vegas can do a lot for you. I I love to just a negotiation of Dennis being like. He wants a vacation, and Jordan's like, what's a vacation? He's like, Dennis, do you think <laughs> yeah. 48 hours will do? He's like, I'll take whatever I can get. <laughs> <laughs> so good. Uh, my next question for you. Yep. I know that they traded Bill Cartwright, right? They traded to get Bill yep. Cartwright. They traded, they traded away Oakley. Oak. Yeah. What would have happened in those rivalry series with the Bad Boy Pistons if Oakley was still on the Bulls? Oh, my God. I mean, <laughs> mal- like ma- Malice of the Palace Part 1, you know, like, <laughs> Yo. Oak, but see, that's the thing, is like, are Mahorn, and especially Lampier, that tough, and throwing around that much weight, if mm-hmm. Oak is still on that team? I mean, like, because Oak isn't somebody you mess around with, you know? Yeah. But here's the other thing, is if they do have Oak... Do they even make it there? A very good point. A very good point. Um, My last question for you, Webby. Can you even fathom some of the shit that Phil Jackson and Dennis Rodman have smoked together? Oh, my God. (laughs) Listen. Listen. As as an enjoyer, um, (laughs) listen, you go in and you look at, you go into the dispensaries nowadays and, how much T uh, like I don't even want to know how much THC those two have been ingested in together. But I will tell you that Phil Jackson, uh, uh, you know, I've talked a lot about like you know, it seems like a good hang. That's yeah. what I will oh, say. Hell yeah. I, I think I might rather hang with Phil than hang with Rodman. Yo, I don't know if I could survive hanging with Rodman. Just I don't know if I could like. Listen, I don't know if my a- body could take it. And I think that, uh, again, I hate to bring up another podcast, but I think Russillo said this too, was hey, kamikaze shots are gross. <laughs> no thanks, man. Just give me a shot of Jameson. <laughs> Fair enough, my dude. Fair enough. That was that was awesome, man. Again, I really enjoyed this episode. Can't wait for the next episode. Was there anything else you wanted to touch on that maybe we didn't give enough time to uh. in this other than Jordan saying, why would I want to pass the ball to Bill Cartwright? <laughs> I don't want Bill Cartwright to touch the ball. Just That's not Bill- an offense. That's bullshit. <laughs> you know? just, yo, just the, the fact that Bill Cartwright looks like a nerd. <laughs> he does. does look like a nerd, man. But I'll tell you, man, next week we are going to have a, a lot to talk about. That's all okay. I'll say. Next week, we're going to have a lot to talk to, about. And there's another kind of uh, vacation thing that happens okay. that, we'll, that we'll check out. It's too good, too. Uh, one thing I was going to ask you, I love the Jordan quote, there's no I in team, but there is in win, shouts to yeah. Mike. Uh, <laughs> almost as good as Kobe's, which was there's no, uh, there's, no I in, uh, what, there's no I in team, but there's a me in motherfucker. <laughs> uh, I always like that quote from Kobe. Uh, two, one, this didn't come out in the episode at all, but when I saw Will Purdue, because it took a second to be like, who the hell is that? Yeah, right? yeah, I didn't realize yeah. it was Will Purdue, but someone tweeted after that uh, in the Jordan rules, it came out that Jordan called Will Purdue Will Vanderbilt because he wasn't good enough for Purdue. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's pretty good. <laughs> That's savage. That is savage. savage. Well, shout out to Vanderbilt's gym. <laughs> Vanderbilt has an awesome basketball court. I think I do remember that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And when it's they were kind of smaller, right? Yeah, yeah. It's kind of like the it setup like is a, all different than like other gyms. Yeah, it yeah. looks like a high school gym. Will Vanderbilt? Will, <laughs> that's, that's, so that's, good. that's pretty MJ, savage. MJ is the man. Like this, this doc makes me love MJ even more. And I know that every week we should do this at the end, where it's like. So do people still think 
LeBron's better than MJ, and I'm doing it jokingly because I'm not here for that argument. I don't care about that argument. I never want to have that argument. I think it's dumb, but I just find it funny that people still will use any excuse to try to be like, see, look, MJ's better, or see, look, LeBron would score 60, and it's like, guys, just stop. Just relax, exactly. Yeah, like, Mike would be working out totally differently if he played in this era, and LeBron would be working out totally differently if he played in that era. Like, you can't... (sighs) Anyways... Let's just end. You know what? I'm going to just end the pod on Will Vanderbilt. On Will. (laughs) Okay. How about that? Webby, where can the people hit you up, man, if they want to get at you? Let me know what you're thinking about. uh, You know, what? I need some good music recommendations. So I need the people out there who are still. Because usually, like, I'm listening to music at work. So from working from home, I'm not up on the new tunes i think the last thing that i have that i like downloaded on my spotify was the new da baby album and i haven't really given it a good listen to so if anybody's got some new music recommendations please hit me up on twitter or on instagram it's the same for both at a webster 84 uh, I wish I could help you on some new music listens, but if you follow me on Instagram, you know that I published a picture of the playlist that I was listening today, which was <laughs> Mace Essentials. So. <laughs> Actually, I will tell you that my wife the other day was like, babe, what's the best Mace song? And I was like, oh, there's a couple of good ones. But uh, I, I, honestly, I, I love Welcome Back, man. When he came back with the with the Mr. Yeah, Car- yeah, with yeah. Mr. Cotter Yo. beat. Mace Ooh. can't be bad at Mace. Listen, without LL, there's no Mace. Without Mace, there's no Ja Rule and 50. Without Ja Rule and 50, there's no Drake. So I'm sure there's some people in between there that were skipping, but Mace was a moment in time. 100%. Right? Nothing but respect for Mace. <laughs> and somehow we went from Will Vanderbilt to Mason Betha, but that's just what we do <laughs> on the Hot Blast podcast, right? It's just what we do. Um, my name is Sheldon Alexander. You can find me on Twitter at Shell Alexander on Instagram at Sheldon Alexander. And, you know, hit us up. Let us know what you're thinking. Like and subscribe to the On Blast podcast. we got lots of stuff for you now in these self-isolation times. Not only am I keeping myself busy, but I'm trying to keep y'all entertained as well with a lot of whole grain goodness. So check us out. Like and subscribe on iTunes, SoundCloud, Spotify, YouTube. Like and subscribe, tell your friends, spread the love that is the On Blast podcast, because like I always say, I used to pray for times like this to rhyme like this. This is the On Blast podcast, as always, unpolished and unapologetic. Until next time, see ya. Peace.